here. Um, introduce yourself. It would be great to see you wherever you are, what you're doing. I'd love to know. I'd love to know. I have just woken up here in Sydney, Australia. So just quickly, a bit about me, some essential things you need to know. Um, one of my favorite bands is The Clash. Love The Clash, love music, have a background in music, radio, storytelling. Um, for the past 10 years, I've worked at the Australian Public Broadcaster, the ABC, as well as a bunch of other things. But um, yes, music, radio, uh, storytelling, narrative, different narrative shows here in Australia. Um, Mighty Ducks is my favorite movie. Um, that's about it. That's all there is to that, just teamwork. I just think it's a good trilogy. <laughs> You know, I just think the arc is good and the characters and ice hockey is so foreign, you know, like I've seen snow twice in my life. So uh, I know nothing about the only thing I know about ice hockey is the Mighty Ducks. The third thing I'd say about just to introduce myself, Sausage Sizzles. Uh, Sausage Sizzles has become the shorthand for me sort of describing this, the type of stories I do. Um, uh, now, I did play this piece and I did give this talk uh, at uh, Hearsay last year, but I've revised it for live stream edition. Um, so hopefully there's something in it for you. But when I played this sausage, we premiered this sausage sizzle piece at the hearsay. We got to, someone, some people came and got through the whole half an hour documentary about the history of sausage sizzles. And at the end, uh, during the question, somebody said, what is a sausage sizzle? Um, so I <laughs> uh, didn't really, there was a bit of a cultural thing that didn't really tra uh, transcend that space, but a sausage sizzle is a, it's like a hot dog and here in Australia, we have sausage sizzles all the time. We have them in hardware stores and um, it's a uniquely Australian thing. And uh, I make stories about things like that. Um, and that is just like a quirky uh, cultural story. That's not really a story that um, I've made a story to be like the, you know, what is the, what is the history of this thing? And somehow we got half an hour out of it. Um, so that's that. When we, when we talk about Gonzo, um, we think of this guy, don't we? Hunter S. Thompson. I should say, I'm not an expert in Gonzo, the genre of Gonzo. I, uh, I have just been thinking about it. I uh, consider, I s see a lot of the things that uh, these little things pop up in stories I make and stories that you guys do. And I'm like, ah, oh, that's a Gonzo. What is that? What is that? I think that's a Gonzo thing. That, that, that is a way, it's a way of sort of interpreting uh, a particular technique that uh, I hear and we're going to go through. Uh, I, hey, Jack, so glad you could make it, man. Thank you for coming. Um, uh, yeah, and hopefully, I'm um, talking about this philosophy, this gonzo thing, and hopefully it sparks something in you and maybe you think about, you, you think about what you're already doing in a slightly different way. I don't make... You know, nobody calls himself, hey, I'm a gonzo storyteller. Nobody says that. Firstly, it's a bit lame. But secondly, you know, you just, you just wouldn't say that. Um, uh, <laughs> um, and I don't do gonzo stories all the time. I just use these little degrees of gonzo, okay? Degrees of gonzo, that's what I'm talking about. But yeah, look, Hunter S. Thompson, widely claimed to be where, this, where, where the genre kicked off. Um, when he did his what associated with his you know wild road trip stories uh, we've also got this guy uh, lots of people love to to talk about Louis um, you know lots of radio people want to be like Louis what is it about Louis why is Louis Gonzo well you will find out soon uh, what makes him particularly Gonzo um, but what about other mediums other crafts I would consider these guys Penn and Teller if anyone likes magic um, Obviously, I do <laughs> with the trick. Um, uh, I, I think they're gonzo magicians, okay? And you'll find out why soon. But this is another touchstone, I guess. What about in terms of audio? In terms of audio stories and podcasts, these, just check these ones out. These are shows that, again, no one says, hey, I'm a gonzo show. I would just say they use elements of this particular genre. Um so yeah, a few of them you might have heard or you might have seen. There are heaps of others as well. But yeah, like I say, there's no Gonzo show. Uh, it's just elements of Gonzo. One sec.
Okay. I literally just woke up. I literally just woke up. <laughs> uh, okay. Do it at 7 a.m. Yeah. No worries. I thought I would I thought I would like go for a walk, have some time. Nah. Dreaming. Okay, here's a plan we're gonna go through. We're gonna go through the elements of Gonzo. We are gonna go through uh some <laughs> audio examples. I may have stuffed that up because I couldn't get that to work, sorry. Uh but degrees of Gonzo, why Gonzo, challenges of Gonzo. But first I'm gonna start with the most deepest thing. Uh possibly the most interesting thing of all. And it's a question for you. I'd love to hear what you think about this. So jump in the comments and let me know. What is your job title? When you have to fill out a form or tell someone or on your website or whatever, what do you write? I am genuinely interested to know uh what's what's your what's your job title? Let me know. And and there's a reason I want to know. Um, because, like I said, we're starting deep. We're starting deep. Um, this question is going to come, become very important later in terms of how we think about what we're doing. Um, thank you for some of, those, some of those comments coming through. I just panicked and then changed the subject. <laughs> yes, Helen. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I try and avoid, avoid it too. They're sort of, I'm not into job titles. I don't like job titles, okay? When I started in radio, it was all about feature makers. Feature makers, that was what long form audio people did. They were feature makers. Um, in America, I see sort of people talking about the reporter. The reporter is the thing and then you've got associate reporter and whatever, there's great, um, you know, status levels around that, that seem to be uh, seem to be a bit more, you know, consistent. Uh, are you a documentary maker? Are you a producer? Do you just you make things happen? Producer, it's such a catch-all thing, you know? Producer. Also, you know, I see job ads where it's like multi-platform reporter. Uh, Mr. McC McAleese, thank you. Too weird to live too strange. No one is willing to say what they what they what they call themselves. <laughs> no one wants to go on record. Fair enough. I respect that. Um, it, it's a bit it's a bit of an existential question for me, and it, and I, I, it's one of those things I've struggled with because ten years or so into my career, I'm still wondering, uh, what am I? <laughs> what, what what am I in the story? Who am I in the story? How is this meant to work? The obvious one that I didn't mention was the J word, journalist. I know I'm not that. I'm not a journalist, but but I use um, I use journalism techniques all the time. So, do I have a problem with saying what I am or what my role is? Because I'm afraid that uh, is this the thing that's driving my. Um, my insecurity. Why is it? I think the next piece I'm going to do is going to be the one where people are going to figure out I'm actually a fraud, and I've been winging it this entire time, including during this presentation up until at this point right right now. Um, that I haven't actually done a, you know, I, I failed a, I dropped out of a psychology degree, and you know, I just sort of fell into into making stories and radio, and yeah, I've had a lot of experience, but you know. I'm not really qualified in, I haven't got a ticket or anything, you know? I think people hide under job titles sometimes. There's, there's this protection in labeling it. Like if, if you say I'm this, then it means this is what I do and this defines me. But with what we're doing a lot of the time, you know, I, at least in my work, taking photos online, trying to um, build an audience, you know, it, it's, how, how do you define all that? Um, 7 a.m. in Gonzo. Like say with uh, with journalism, this is, and this is where I'm getting to a point here, right? When you're a journalist, uh, you aren't real. You are this kind of, you know, I don't know, this sort of non-human objective thing, right? You're a journalist and you speak in a certain cadence. I can't even do it right. Let me think. There's people I know that do it. 
you know, they speak in this cadence that their voice is slightly deeper. They're not themselves is what I'm trying to say. They're a journalist and they have to do these things because they have to be object, um, objective, right? These are the things we need to do to be objective. But are these the people you want to trust? <laughs> these people, these are some of the most focused people ever. They're just reading off a screen. They're robots. Uh, so I don't want to get into some sort of anti-news thing, but these are things I think about when I'm trying to figure out who am I in the story. And with long-form storytelling, the options of who you are, who you can be, I just think there's so m there's so many more options for how you can be deeper, you can be realer, and you can use the medium um, to be to be not more intimate, right? Audio isn't the, forget the intimate thing. Audio is the most real medium, in my opinion. And it's because we've got these options. We've got more options because it is vague. And uh, another thing I, I, I think about, like with script, when you're reading script, you know, why is it so hard to be yourself on, <laughs> you know, when you do try and be yourself, you know, I'm sure you've all been there. Um, especially when you start, like if it's, even now, it's hard to, scripting is hard, you know, reading script as yourself, be natural, just be yourself, be conversational, tell it like your friend, go, you know. How can you read this? How can you do these things if you don't know who you are or if you're struggling with your own identity or your own existential questions? I don't know. I've thought about this a lot. I've thought about this so much. And when I, I've come up with an answer, and the answer might surprise you of to this question, what am I? Who am I? Who am I in the story? How is this meant to work? And the answer is Mike. That is the answer to the question. What am I? I am a human. I am from Australia. The Clash is one of my favorite bands. I love the Mighty Ducks. I make stories about sausage sizzles. Uh, I make mistakes. I eat too much pizza. Um, if you accept that you are yourself in a story, suddenly the way you think about stories might be different, and that's something that I've found. And when I hear when I hear people using these techniques, when it feels different, it feels realer than real. This is Gonzo. This is transcending the medium. This is sort of taking things to a new level where it's like, hey, I'm acknowledging we're in a story. This is, this is a, I don't know, <laughs> a construct. I'm a human, you're a human. Uh, uh, there's no chance, Obje objectivity isn't real. So let's just try and call something for what it is. This is, this is realer than real. Realer than real. Realer than real. That's my real and real cam. Uh, okay, are you with me? I'm just checking in the comments. Uh, good breakfast. Eat a good breakfast. Hello, young Mike. Uh, all of this is relevant to figuring out what I'm about to what, go back and do. Let's have a look at Gonzo. Um, but the big takeaway here, this is this is sort of the, the biggest thing. If you take this or this and nothing else, it is this. Uh, this is my takeaway. If you want to become a better storyteller, you should work on becoming a better person. Pause for dramatic effect. That's where I'm at. That's where I'm at. That's what I'm thinking about. I don't know. Is that, that this could either be the most vague, like bullshit thing that means nothing, or it could, or I'm a genius and I'm going to change your life. It's a very fine line, uh, but this, this is what this is where I got to. When you when you do when you you know you go through all the steps, um, uh, you know we're all just doing a flying V together, basically, Wendy, aren't we? Um. Jeff says that's me screwed then. <laughs> um, yeah, because you know what? The existential question as a radio maker is hard because it is hard to know. Uh, it is hard to reckon with yourself, with who you are. The self-doubt thing is something that I speak to a lot of radio makers about. A lot of storytellers struggle with this, the self-doubt thing. Uh, it's something I've, I'm just going through it at the moment, you know? have these good periods and you do heaps of heaps of work and these big projects and then you crash at the end of it and then you, and you, I sort of go how did I do that 
how did I do? I, I, I listened back to something. Like, I don't even know how that happened. There are not, there, there aren't other professions that have that, you know, like my, my brothers who are electricians, you know, they don't have this sort of existential thing where they're like, am I really an electrician? How did I, how did I do that PowerPoint? How did that work? You know, other, other careers don't have that. It's such a unique thing. And, um, uh, I hope I hope this has given you some some sort of value. You're on you're on some sort of wavelength as I wake up. Good morning, Sydney, Australia. It's pretty weird doing a live stream. Okay, all right. Let's get into the Gonzo. What the hell is Gonzo? What am I talking about? Um, oh, actually, I, I didn't even flesh out that point. Sorry. This is what I mean by by making better programs. You want to make you want to make you want to be a better person. This is this is why this is so stu- dumb and stupid and perfect. You want to be smarter so you can um, bring more ideas to the table, more perspectives, make a more re- fully rounded story. I want to be healthier, so I, I just I'm just talking about from my perspective, like healthier, so I can be sharper and I can edit without getting injured. Uh, want to be more emotionally regulated, so I can be more empathetic and understand people and connect with people when I'm doing interviews. Want to have more experiences, save up and travel so I can get culture. No, on and on and on. All these things are going to make you a better storyteller. Uh, that's my big, my big thing I'm working on. The big project is trying to become a better person to become a better storyteller. Isn't is that isn't this? Am I wrong? Tell me if I'm wrong. It's so dumb. It's so good. In my, I don't know. <laughs> it's so good. Live stream. All right. So this is why it's hard. Um, to do gonzo because if somebody if, if you do put yourself on the line and you do share something with yourself something about yourself uh, and somebody doesn't like it and this is why it's hard this is why it's hard to be yourself when you are reading script i think too by the way is because if you are being yourself and you put yourself into your story and somebody somebody doesn't like that story what they're really saying is they don't like you and so if that's the case and if you follow those steps out then what do you do about that? Well, you you try and be a better person. What if what if the, the audience doesn't like it? But what if you don't like what you capture? What if you be yourself and you try and be real and you don't like it? Well, this is this is this is the existential question. Um, and the key to Gonzo is that uh, essentially you are a participant. And we are going to get to like what is Gonzo. We will go through the four my fourth things of what is Gonzo. But essentially you are a participant in the story you want a journalist you know this objective thing you are a participant in the story you can interact with the story um and this is the this is the trade-off of trying to be realer than real um the trade-off is that if you put yourself out there you could go deeper you could could go more intimate or vulnerable but um uh, if you miss something and you come off self-indulgent or unethical or lame, then, you know, it's really embarrassing. So the stakes are higher, but essentially, we've got to put something on the line. So what is Gonzo? Okay, four big ideas here with Gonzo. Let's smash through them. Thank you for sticking with me. Um, thank you for those comments on um, on self-doubt. Jack. Okay. I have to come back. So I try to work this out. Look at the comments. I don't know. Let's keep going. I'm assuming that's um, some good chat. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. First, number one, the person telling the story, active participant. They are generally playing themselves. Um, what is the difference between a person doing a monologue where they're in the story and gonzo well uh i define this by saying okay um who owns the story who's the story about uh and if the story is about is about the person then it's probably uh, the, the, the person making the story well then it's probably not gonzo for example last year i did a series called backflip where i tried to improve my health by learning to do a backflip um now there were degrees, like this wasn't Gonzo. This was like a memoir thing. This is like a diary, personal journal thing. It wasn't Gonzo. It might have felt Gonzo at times because I was bringing in all the experts and looking out and, you know, things like that. But essentially, 
it uh, I, I wouldn't define that as Gonzo. That that lent in a different direction. So whose whose story is it? Uh, if it's not your story and you're a participant in the story, you are you are you are might be acting Gonzo. Okay, number two, acknowledging that objectivity is a myth. Now this might be this might be controversial. I'd love to know what you think about this. Uh, personally, I. Uh, in terms of what I do, like I'm not a, I'm not a, as I say, I'm not a journalist. Uh, I understand there is a place for objectivity or the pursuit of objectivity. Absolutely. Uh, I don't want you thinking I'm some, I don't know, crazy, crazy dude who's like, objectivity is a myth, but I kind of am that guy. <laughs> I kind of am saying that as well. Uh, how, how can you be human how can we be human if we want to do something realer than real? And this is the opportunity you have with Gonzo. Once you, once you acknowledge that uh, this is objective, the story is objective, the edits, every decision is objective. There's a certain empowerment that comes with that. That's what I've found in my experience anyway. Okay. Acknowledging that when you're making a story, it's a story. Okay. Again, we see some empowerment here. When we see the edges of the story, you know, why do we, when we call someone often include the ringtone in a story, you know, we don't need the ringtone or sometimes we get a ringtone sound effect or whatever. Why are we doing that? Um, because we want to acknowledge that we are in a story. And this is, uh, this is something that is used in therapy a lot and Louis Theroux does this so much where halfway through the interview you, you ask you, you do some reflection on the interview itself so you ask it how's the interview going what do you think of this interview what do you think of this story <laughs> we are sort of breaking a fourth wall here when we do that um check my notes here uh, sometimes these are just very small things, okay? And these might be things you're doing and they feel they feel right, but you don't know why you're doing it. Or maybe you're trying to acknowledge that you're in a story. Acknowledging the limitations of the medium uh, is also part of this as well. You know, if you if you acknowledge the medium, acknowledge your weaknesses, there's a strength to that. And you can sort of transcend those things. That might be, that's too uh, too early to be talking like that. How you doing, Philippe Perez? You still with us? No, he's gone. All right. Um, <clears throat> the next thing is sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, Gonzo uses fiction. And this is, this is like the far end of Gonzo, like the, the extreme wing, one extreme wing of, of Gonzo using fiction. Uh, Philippe's still with us. Thank God. Go on you, Philippe. Um, there's a radio documentary maker <clears throat> based in Australia called Natalie Kesticher, and she has done real in, done this mixture of real interviews and made up characters that tell a story and the audience is not meant to know what's real and what's not real and in some ways firstly it doesn't matter wait wait if the audience is in on it if the audience if the audience is in on it doesn't matter that's the question if we're trying to express something that can't be ex expressed. Uh, why does it like? Here's a real example. Do you use atmosphere in your stories? Do you record atmosphere? Do you ever insert sound effects? You didn't get them in the field, but then you came back. Like that is, you are making that is a that is a, a, a element that's partly fictional, right? And there are some shows that are very anal about not doing that sort of thing. Like you say, this American life sees itself very much as a, you know, they are journalists, they're reporters, and they have rules around that. They would never re-record a question or things like that. But out in the Wild West, uh, the real world, uh, if I can say that, um, 
everyone's still do, people are doing that left, right, and center. In my in my experience, at least in the people I talk to, maybe not. Tell me if I'm wrong. But these little things to try and um, make a story, smooth a story out, uh, tra- transitions, uh, things with scripts, it's not necessarily real, right? It's 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 hyper real. Uh, you you could look at that as a fictional element. I'll give you a real like big example. And sorry to use Louis through again, but this is just such a such a big one. If you saw his Scientology documentary, um, you will see that uh, he couldn't get access to the church, so he did those big scenes with the reenactments where he got actors in. The whole movie was that to try and give an insight, and the audience was in on it. So once again, we're transcending the the medium. We're empowering. You know, he was empowering himself to try and get to the bottom of something that he otherwise wouldn't have got. He, that, that movie, that was the whole point of that movie. That, that, the, the, they, he, you know, because he couldn't make it, that documentary. So he got in these actors and did it that way. But it's, we don't call it a piece of fiction. It's, it's still a documentary. It's a documentary technique that he used. Okay, that's enough for that. Um, realer than real. Realer than real. Degrees, degrees of gonzo. Um, a lot of people are doing gonzo techniques. They don't realize it. Hopefully, this has given you some ideas for how you can you can um, you can think about you can empower yourself to embrace gonzo or gonzo ideas uh, to make your stories better or more real, <clears throat> etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Good morning. Good morning. So we're going to have some examples here, but I couldn't, I couldn't get that worked out in time. So sorry, I don't have any examples, but uh, I can point you to some examples if you want to know what I'm talking about. Um, there was a show I worked on a few years ago called The Real Thing, and most of the stories that I uh, looked at for that series, uh, I was using Gonzo techniques. So again, they weren't all gonzo. They were just gonzo techniques. So again, I'm, I apologize. I can't play you anything today. But there was a story about uh, called, if you Google Lisa Lorenz and you listen to how that played out throughout that story, I'll just point you to two. Uh, and Mary Lunig, that episode was called There's Something About Mary Lunig. Those two episodes had it. But I'll give you, I'll give you another example. Something I heard really recently was... Um, uh, the latest Shortcuts episode, the piece by Jess Shane. Uh, she goes back and does a story reflecting with the person she made a story about years before and that person wasn't happy with the story. I'm just going to turn my blinds because the sun's coming in and uh, it's blinding me. So let me do that one sec. Okay, that's a bit better. Okay, listen to Shortcuts um, and Jess Shane's piece. Uh, it's a bit laid. It's a bit meta. It is gonzo. It is gonzo. She is in a story acknowledging that the person she did a story with years before wasn't happy with the story and she's playing tape in a way uh, tape from the original story that's meant to make us rethink um, why she. Ma- I mean, it's so it's so meta. The theme of the episode is about storytelling. Um, but if you have a listen to that, that is a great example of uh, of Gonzo. But let's just quickly go through again in the degrees of Gonzo. What is not Gonzo? Okay, so we talked about memoir, monologues, audio diaries. These are not these are not Gonzo, right? If you're doing an audio diary about yourself, that's not Gonzo. Uh, that's just an audio diary. Okay, these are these are their own uh, genres that need to be respected. Uh, audio drama, mockumentary, they might incorporate Gonzo ideas, but they're not Gonzo. Again, ask who owns the story. Whose story is it? If it's your story, if it's about you, 
it's probably not Gonzo. If you're an active participant in the story or you're acknowledging your role as the storyteller, um, then it could be Gonzo. And Pritha, yeah, I just let me just check these comments here because I want to see what uh, what you guys are thinking. Yes, the Jess Shane piece was wild. You know, it was so awkward. I was sitting there in that piece just squirming because it's so awkward. And what she does in that piece is she acknowledges that the first time she tried to make it, oh, I wish I could play this piece for you. Please go, don't, don't do anything else after this. Go and listen to that piece. But what she does in the piece is she acknowledges and you hear the audio of her trying to manufacture a scene. And we've all done things like this. Um, and that is my point about when you let go of things like that, which she did in the, this new piece. And she acknowledges that. There's all this sort of empowerment that she gets as a storyteller in um, in telling it, in acknowledging that, yeah, maybe I was trying to tell a story in a particular way. And she's got the audio to back it up. I was like, oh, no, I've been seen. I've been seen. Uh, hey, Crystal. Uh, yes, yeah, sweating hard. Uh, thanks for joining us, Crystal. Uh just catching up on the comments here. Oh, Philip, you've edited your questions. Yeah, hell yeah. She restages interviews with real people. Yes, that's what she did. She restaged them. Tell users scoring. Hey, yeah, that's a Marty. That's a great point about the music. Tell users scoring. Absolutely. And this is that that speaks to my point about what where, where is the line between objective and subjective when you're dealing in a cr creative medium, you know? I don't know why pretend that why pretend you're trying to stick on one side or the other. Why not just embrace it? That's my point. Embrace it, become realer than real. Who's that maker in Australia that mixes real interviews with fictional characters? Ah, Natalie Kestitcher. Natalie Kestitcher, listen to her piece, String, Pritha. String by Natalie Kestitcher. A lot of her work uses that technique. Uh, she was doing it before everyone. Was Hunter S. Thompson a good person? I didn't know him personally. Um, he definitely wasn't healthier. Yeah. Yeah, Jack, that's a good point. Um, well, screw Hunter S. Thompson. That's what I say to that. <laughs> Don't worry about Hunter S. Thompson, all right? Forget that guy. Don't worry about Hunter, mate. All right. Sorry, I don't have the audio. That sucks. Sorry. Had some stuff to play for you. All right. Why is Gonzo good? Okay, here's the case. Let me sell it to you if I haven't, uh, if I haven't already. A lot of the time when I talk to emerging producers, and I feel like this is an idea in the wider audio community, there is an idea that if you have a non-narrated piece, that piece is somehow, uh, don't want to say worth more, but it is more pure because there's no audio storyteller narrator voice meddling, <laughs> meddling with the story. Uh, do you think this, this is that idea? Please let me know in the comments. Um, and I th this is what I think about that, if you're not getting where I'm going with this. Yes, it might sound more, um, less cluttered, like there's a particular sound with non-narrated pieces. But the idea that a piece is going to be uh, more, more pure storytelling-wise because there's no narrator, I think, is not only... Not true. I think it's actually the opposite because what you have to do to create a piece that's non-narrated is you have to ask them, ask, generally you have to ask the talent to do all these extra things because you need full answer questions. So in some ways, in terms of getting a real story and the realer than real pursuit, um, stories that are non-narrated generally are more manufactured and are less real than real because we're playing this kind of game of, uh, hey, we're, we're in the, uh, shit, I hope I'm not pissing anyone off saying this, sorry. I make, um, 
I make um, <laughs> non-narrated stories all the time as well. So, uh, yeah, it's nothing against non-narrated stories. Uh, nothing at all. It's just this idea that audio produ- I, I, I when I talk to a lot of audio producers, they're like, oh, I don't want the story to be about me. And if my narration's in there, the story's about me. No, it's not. No, it's not. I think that's part of the coming back to the existential thing at the top, this is part of our fear of, um, of actually capturing ourselves and putting ourselves out there. Uh, it's just part of that. It has nothing to do with the actual story. Um, there are so many decisions you make that go into it, um, into a story. The questions, how you edited it, how you mixed it, that your voice is within the story whether you are narrating it or not and this is a great thing about that hearsay last year uh when i first talked about these ideas is that sarah rangecroft from uh shortcuts who does a lot of those pieces she did it she she was saying she was acknowledging that and saying that exactly the same thing but from her perspective as someone who uh is a kind of master of of that particular genre of non-narrated pieces uh which i thought was super interesting and um that was really cool that, yes, yeah, she was, as someone who makes that stuff all the time, that she was right in there. Okay. Okay. Seen as less crafted. It's catching up on your comments here, Crystal. You can't see the reporting or the work. Not, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, nah, that's what I'm saying. Yep. Uh, non-narrated is seen as, is seen as less crafted. Yes. Hold on. Is that what I said? Yes, I think it's seen as less crafted and it feels left cra- less crafted when you hear it, but I actually think more goes into it. Would you agree with that or not? I don't know. It's certainly the things I've done that you have to do a lot of extra work to try and make that style work. Anyway, um, when you acknowledge, start acknowledging these things, lack of ob- objectivity, we're in the story, all these things open up to you, empowerment, is one thing empowerment to try and be real than real i won't do the thing again um yeah we're saying the same thing on the same page heavy handed let me just catch up on your uh, the invisible hand of adam smith sometimes that's turn into a fist <laughs> yeah 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 i'm not i gotta be clear uh i'm not even advocating for non-narrated or narrated stylized they have their place and this is what we'll get to eventually is using the right pulling the right technique right trick out of your bag out of your kit at the right time because this is essentially extra extra ways of thinking or extra extra kit that i use at the at, try and use at the right time that empowers me to try and tell a story more fully or more deeper etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's what it's doing when i say in terms of empowerment um in terms of vulnerability um i think what happens when you do start playing with these with these techniques or these ideas is that you change the relationship of you the storyteller with the audience so your relationship with the talent is different because you're yourself okay you're just an active participant. Again, the question, who am I? What do I do? What am I? Very easy. Mike, that's who I am. Okay. Don't try and bog it down with job titles. Don't get bogged down in the job title thing, please. Um, You're you're, you're human. You're telling a story. You're having a real connection with someone. You're trying to express that connection in the realest possible way. Okay. That's essentially what uh, what I'm trying to do at least. Um, But when you do that and you show the cracks, where you made the story, uh, whether it be in uh, a question, a slightly different question, how, including the question, including a stuff up of the question, including the phone line, uh, the dialing, including anything that, that, that sort of shows you the edges of how the story is made, showing to the audience that you're acknowledging this is a story. You are lifting the hood and the audience feels like, hey, uh, like that has to change the, how the audience thinks about you. It changes the, the nature of the relationship because you're being more vulnerable. I think it has to happen. I think that's why people have such a strong connection uh, with these particular, these particular masters of the genre. 
Uh, and you know, obviously, Jonathan Goldstein's a great example of this. Uh, I think he's he's hundred percent Gonzo. The stories aren't about him, but he's totally in there messing it. That's the whole premise of the of the of the show. Um, but he, you know, that those stories where they're unfolding in real time are, are you know, they're super exciting, aren't they? When you when you hear something unfolding, somebody's being themselves, and uh, you get somewhere different than when you started and you feel like you're in on it. I guess that's what happens. You, you're you more invested in the story uh, when you get to see the cracks of how the story was made. The, 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 the last thing I say about that in terms of vulnerability is we ask so much of the people we interview. You know, we, we go to the deepest corners of the most heavy shit that they have been through uh, over hours, you know, two, three hour interviews uh, for this sort of long form storytelling. Why are we not asking a fraction of that for ourselves when we're telling the story? This is a question I have, an uh, honest question I have for you, you know. We can't expect, I don't think it's fair to ask, you know, all that crazy stuff about people and want them to be so honest and connect with them and not be willing to uh, to put a bit of ourselves out there on the line too. A bit of vulnerability, okay? Uh, and I know uh, often when you're doing those sorts of interviews, one technique is you will give a bit of yourself during the interview and obviously you're not going to use that in the piece. And obviously there's, there's you know, it doesn't call for it half the time. But I'm not, I'm not saying you have to give what, you know, talent is giving equally or whatever. I'm just saying, put yourself on the line, be a bit more vulnerable and see what happens. Uh, because again, you will change the nature of the relationship with the audience. Um, yeah, yeah. That's a good point, Helen. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I should, uh, I should clarify that. Um, yeah, I mean, look, we're doing interviews, you know, especially with your program, you're, you're smashing out episodes. You're going to have time to uh, be vulnerable every episode. That's not the nature of your, of your, of your show. But so, sometimes, sometimes at the right time, at the right time, you might want to uh, have that in your back pocket to be willing to go somewhere, um, go somewhere. And I'm sure you've, I'm sure you've already, already done that. Um, yeah, so I guess I was talking about two things there. The first thing is, okay, as a technique, when you're interviewing someone, I'm saying you <laughs> you, you might put yourself out there to get more out of them, okay? Knowing that you're not going to use that in the story, okay? That's one thing. <laughs> I'm saying, yeah, I'm saying. And then the second thing is when the time is right, uh, depending on actually using something, um, sorry, this is it's too early. Good morning, Sydney. Woo! Um, oh, that's good to know. You, you don't give anything of yourself. You don't have emotions. <laughs> Should work in news. Yeah. Um, you don't need to pour your heart out in every story. Uh, but you might want to at some point. It's hard. Maybe I, maybe I could have had more examples because it's hard to. <laughs> it's hard to. This is something that you know. Of all the stories I'm doing, uh, Gonzo, pure Gonzo, is not kind of something. Like it's just it just pops up. This is what I'm talking about. And the purpose, I guess, maybe the purposes of this chat is just just to to, to label it and sort of pull some of these ideas together and go, hey, what's going on there? Why does it? Why does why does this particular particular technique feel good? Or feel different, or I like that. That was different. We did. We 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 went a bit. You know, we transcended something. Okay. Often, it, often in my experience, what's going on there is Gonzo. As I say, I'm not an expert in Gonzo. Uh, so take all of this with a relative bag of salt. 
All right, we're going we're getting to the end here, guys. Thanks so much for sticking with me. I uh, hope you're enjoying your Saturday night or your your morning. Um, someone in all the all my Toronto friends who tuned in with the perfect Toronto time. Meanwhile, uh, folk, folks in Western Australia, it's bloody 5 a.m. over there and uh, they would have loved to tune in, but they're asleep. So anyway, <laughs> time zones, huh? Um, yeah, S- Scott Carey is a great example of, um, of, of Gonzo uh, across his work. And, and often when he's not you know, using it, not using it, uh, you look through his, 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 his podcast, you'll, you'll see it there pop up from time to time. Other times it doesn't. So what's going on here? Challenges, let's, let's, let's bring it home. Thinking about Gonzo, um, <clears throat> it's not about you. And this is sometimes the, the it, it, Gonzo cops a bad rap for, you know, w- being self-indulgent or, or whatever. But you've got to think about what I said before, where the story, the story sh- isn't about you. You are just an, a participant in the story. Um, that's, that's my, that's how I see it anyway. So a good, a good, a good way to think about it is how is this giving value? You know, there's no point being vulnerable for the sake of it and this maybe this gets back gets back to your point helen you know what's the point in that that's that's just that that's just self-indulgent it has to actually provide value for the audience or say something to for the piece okay that's what that's what's going on here it's about value it's about adding to the piece going deeper um so uh are you offering value are you offering something deeper that you wouldn't normally be able to do if this was a straighter story? Uh, do you need it? As I say, nobody really calls himself a gonzo show or a gonzo storyteller. It's just a technique that pops up that you are probably already using right now. You're probably already using these things. You just haven't labeled it. So that's what we've done today. Try to put some put some framework around it. Um, could be helpful, might not. But essentially, does the story call for it? Most of the time, it doesn't. It's just degrees of Gonzo. Um, and finally, you got to come back to this point about facing your existence, facing up to who you are. This is the challenge of Gonzo, and this whole thing about acknowledging. Uh, I hope that I hope this that idea has resonated with some, with some people, and some of that self doubt stuff we talked about, um, because you know sometimes sometimes in some some pieces I've made people are like oh you know Mike's this wacky character in this story, uh, not really I'm just maybe maybe a little little bit wacky in real life and and uh, that's just me being myself in the story and and if that works or it doesn't work, ultimately, I need to come back to this point, this ultimate point, this is why it all comes back to this. If you want to become a better storyteller, uh, you should work on becoming a better person. Hunter S. Thompson, stuff that guy. Don't worry about Jack. Don't worry about Hunter. Okay. Don't worry about Hunter. Forget about Hunter. Okay. Let's talk about Jack. All right. Uh, All right. That's pretty much it. 